So you both know that this course is called How to Change the World, and, and uh, it is a class of, of, of uh, students, I, but they're students uh, of all ages from all over the world. Uh, uh, I think everyone eager to learn about some of the threats to uh, the globe and to, to uh, all of us, uh, but also eager to find ways where they can make a positive difference. And I, I wonder if there are a couple of things that occur to you that our students um, might consider as they think about ways that, uh, in regard to climate change, a really difficult uh, and, and deep challenge in which things they might do to, to make a positive difference. If you're living outside the U.S., the number one thing I believe that you can do is to encourage your government to keep the pressure on the United States and China in particular and some other developed nations, but mostly the, on the U.S. and China, to really reduce their carbon emissions. We need to hear more like the representatives from Indonesia who confronted the United States in open UN forum and make the United States participate with all the other nations. If you live in the United States, I, I believe, and, and in China, I think what we need to do is to A, um, reduce our individual carbon footprints. Yes. This is particularly true in the United States, not in China, which has a very low per capita um, carbon emission. Mm -hmm. But in the United States, our footprint is too high. We have to think about our consumption and the pollution that our consumption is causing. We can all have a very rich lifestyle um, without emitting as much carbon as we're doing. And we also have to put a lot of pressure on our leaders to take the long view, to work um, internationally for us to see that we are not isolated on the planet. We can't be the drivers of global climate change. We have to be responsible citizens. And certainly, um, we have the ethic um, we wouldn't want other communities to hurt us. We have to make sure that we turn that about and say that our self-interest isn't hurting other people. I totally agree. That is absolutely a necessary key. On a m more uh, personal level, what students can do, uh, I do believe that uh, they need to engage in education mm -hmm. uh, at, at all levels, start in kindergarten as yeah. far as I'm concerned and go all the way. Um, both education, both educate on, on, the, on, the, on, on the crisis, but also uh, do things like, um, you know, Black Earth, biochar garden, school garden, yes. which in itself has been proven to improve learning. Yes. Without, mm -hmm. you know, and improve nutrition. Yes. Uh, you know, so f on, on many scores, uh, learning gardens are a must. Yes. All colleges should have farms like, yes. <laughs> like Wesleyan does. It should become part and it should yes. be integrated in the curriculum. Yeah. not as an extracurricular. Yeah. It no, needs to be integrated and it needs to have both an experiential and an and a intellectual yes. uh, approach. Um, and encourage uh, you know, students to do what Barry has done, but additionally to uh, work on new ideas. Yeah you know, mm -hmm. uh, sources of energy. For example, my big uh, push is that when you do biochar, we do it very cheaply, yeah. backyard. This is yeah. what we're trying to do here. You know, we do it with recycle very cheap, but it works. You produce a lot of heat yes. uh, by carbonizing uh, the residues, and you can uh, capture that heat, transform it into energy. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. this is a fairly yeah. simple method. It's right. beyond my means, but <laughs> in some yeah. way, if Makes I get sense. money, yeah. I would like yeah. to do that. Yeah. This, this way of producing energy is totally clean mm -hmm. yeah. if you use agricultural residues. Yes. So you both, you, you produce biochar, and you produce yeah. clean, renewable energy. And there's that balance, there's that integration. Yes, yeah. and I think people have to start small, like I yeah. am doing, you know, in schools, in, in colleges, yeah. 
universities. Uh, and then you hit that tipping point, and, and that little that small small things eventually become more of a wave. And and the, what I've discovered by by working with the school board uh, in Peru is that immediately you know it spreads because yeah. you you get. I mean, it's not you know it takes a lot of work, yes. but the potential is there. Yeah. Well, and, that's that's uh, that, that's so important. I mean, I think you know the I guess the premise of this class is that the potential is there. And through education and through action, direct action, um, that we can begin to actualize that potential. I want to thank you both for joining me in this conversation. I know our students out there around the world will appreciate it. And um, best of luck to you. Thanks. Over the last hundred years, we've already seen significant uh, climate change. But we expect that to accelerate. Scientists expect this to accelerate because of um, uh, the ways in which that some climate change builds on previous climate change. And then you get this accelerating pattern of increasing temperatures. Um, many species have already begun to react to these changes. Uh, they, they do so in, 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 in slow ways, but we now, scientists have, have, sh have shown how, for example, mosquitoes, uh, a certain species of mosquitoes are moving further north. In order to survive in different climates, they are changing um, their habitat. The ones that survive are the ones that are drifting further north, they are the ones that reproduce. The, so, so you have a new, pattern of uh, insect life, in this case, plants are changing uh, where they distribute their seeds. The ones that survive are changing their position on hillsides. As always, natural selection will favor species that can adapt to changes in the natural environment. So selection is already happening. We, of course, are the products ourselves of, of, of natural selection, and some of that happened in regard to climate changes 10,000 years ago. How we adapt to changes today um, uh, will affect evolution. How we change the environment around us will also affect uh, evolution as it is affecting it right now. The difference between the mosquitoes moving north or the plants going up the hillside in our own situation is that our species is capable now of understanding evolution and climate change. Our species has the capacity to reflect on evolution. And we can reflect on the consequences of our own action. We are aware of the just and the unjust dimensions of these changes, and we can react to these changes in ways that change the evolutionary dynamic consciously, purposefully, and not just um, uh, as a mode of our survival for our own particular uh, uh, individual uh, uh, lives. So with that in mind, with the idea that we are not just another species reacting to climate change, but we actually can reflect on climate change and evolution in ways that I hope will alter our behavior and alter the pattern for other species. Um, uh, in that, I would like to go over these six areas of change and talk with you about um, some of the most, uh, some of the salient I issues in, in each of these areas. Uh, the first is rising sea levels, rising sea levels. And uh, we see this uh, around the world, and, um, and the most dramatic places, of course, is where you have islands that are, are already being uh, sw swept under the uh, oceans. Uh, and, and more of this will happen in the coming years. They, uh, islands will disappear. Many of our major cities around the globe are built near coastlines because of uh, the uh, ease of trade that was that came with being built near a coastline, and and these urban centers will have to make dramatic dramatic adjustments. Uh, we we saw this in the, in some in some significant ways in New Orleans and uh, the United States after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, you hear great uh, projects being hatched in New York City. Um, uh, in the wake of uh, Superstorm Sandy a few years ago. The major urban centers uh, are, are changing uh, 
um, their relationship to the coastline and trying to understand how they will cope with the inevitably rising seas. Places like the Netherlands, uh, this is also a, 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 a major project of engineering and urban planning. In many parts of the world, they don't have the capacity to make those projects happen. They don't have the financial uh, uh, resources or the economic resources. Those places will be destroyed. They, their ways of life, uh, their habitat um, will uh, be destroyed. Over the last century, the uh, seas have risen already uh, eight inches, and we expect in the next century somewhere between one foot and four feet uh, to be the range of increase for uh, uh, the uh, water levels, for sea levels over uh, the, the next century. I, I want uh, to use a, 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 a clip from Climate uh, Communication.org to, to give you some sense of um, where um, uh, the most dramatic uh, impact of rising sea levels um, uh, will be felt. In addition to the rising sea levels, and of course related to it, are, are rise, increases in intense rainfalls. Increases in intense rainfall. Uh, you know, we've got one planet, um, and when you warm the planet, uh, you uh, have more moisture in the atmosphere. Uh, warmer temperatures uh, in many places will lead to more evaporation. Um, and that will mean in some parts of the globe, you have uh, the intensification of rains, intense storms that will cause disastrous flooding. Uh, it's interesting because uh, they, we'll also talk about the ways in some other parts of the world there will be greater droughts. And I know that you know some of us hear this and say, "How could you have <laughs> how could you have more rain, more moisture in the air, atmosphere, and also have greater droughts?" But what we see happening, and what what climate scientists are are, are modeling now, is that areas of the globe that ha that already suffer from desertification um, are likely to get even drier, um, and er other areas of the globe uh, are going to have an intensification of rainfall, and a lot of this. Um, uh, excess moisture or increased levels of moisture will result in rainfall that just uh, is over the oceans. Um, but what's clear is that the patterns of climate that have allowed us to build urban centers, to create um, uh, agriculture on a massive scale, that those patterns are changing and that will radically disrupt our current ways of life. Along with um, increased levels of intense rain, we have also seen, and, and I know many of you will have seen evidence of this uh, in various um, uh, um, uh, videos and, and uh, news programs, we will see and are seeing a uh, uh, decrease in um, snow cover and a, a dramatic melting of the world's greatest glaciers. Uh, this uh, is uh, dumping uh, huge amounts of water um, into uh, the ocean um, and contributing to rising sea levels um, and um, disturbing vital ecosystems. And I, I, I have a couple of uh, uh, examples of this to, to show you. Uh, um, the one uh, I've, I've picked out to, to show you here is, is a video that uh, has a couple of uh, um, scientists uh, and adventurers, I think, actually uh, taking measurements of uh, glacier melt uh, in, in, in Greenland. And um, this will show you the, the energy uh, of these changes and how uh, with the speed of uh, a massive waterfall, uh, glaciers are um, um, uh, that have been around for thousands of years in some cases are um, melting and pouring uh, water uh, into the oceans. So uh, that uh, is disturbing, having an impact on um, uh, sea levels and on the ecosystems of the areas of the world uh, that depend um, on uh, the stability of uh, of the oceans. The, there will also be um, increase in heat waves, and we've seen this already. Uh, 
Since the 1950s, there has uh, have been a, a, a dramatic increase in the number of heat waves around the world, and they last longer. The hottest days and nights have become hotter, and the hottest days and nights are more frequent than they were before. In the past several years, the global area hit by extremely hot summertime temperatures has increased 50-fold, 50 times more uh, uh, of extreme heat in the summertime. And uh, this results in uh, increased wildfires, uh, which we've seen in various parts of the world uh, in recent years. Uh, most recently uh, in Australia, I had a, a, another class on Coursera called the Modern and the Postmodern uh, in, uh, in the fall of 2013. And um, many of my students in Australia were uh, writing to uh, students from other parts of the world uh, about um, uh, their having to cope with these wildfires, which um, are instigated by uh, an increase in summertime temperatures and a decrease in summertime humidity. Um, Droughts are also a significant problem uh, that come with increased temperatures in the summertime. And what we see are, I mean, there have always been droughts, and that's, of course, what sometimes the skeptics will say, well, there have always been droughts. But what we see now, when we plot these things on, uh, on, in, in models and on graphs, what we see now are droughts are occurring with greater frequency in different parts of the world, and they're lasting longer. And so you have the intensification of the extremes, which will make it harder for us to maintain our, our, um, our, our agriculture uh, and our urban life um, in various parts of the world.